Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Trivia. My name is Blake. I'm joined by Chelsea tonight and will be your host for this evening. But before we get started in Trivia, why don't we find out what we're playing for? Great question, Blake. We are competing for the best night at Crossfire. What we are looking at is we are looking at pizzas. We are looking at dessert. We are looking at the comfiest seats for the session. You really, really want your grade to win trivia. So Blake, what is it going to look like? Well, it's a great question, Chelsea. We have five topics, 10 questions per topic, totaling to a total of 51 questions. You might be asking five times 10, Blake, how on earth does that equal 51? Well, there's one extra question. The question we've all been asking, who's our contestants? So let's meet our contestants for the sports round. Representing the Royals, we have Ryan. All right, representing the Braves, we have Jacob. Woo! Representing the Wolves, we have Jack. Up the Wolves, come on. Representing the Stags, we have Mimi. Representing the Mavs, we have Sam. Up the Mavs. And for the Lions, we have Nate. Let's go. And finally, representing the Warriors, we have Evan. There we are. <laughs> you. All right, so contestants, how it works for this evening. We're going to be asking the questions. You're going to be answering the questions, but how are you going to answer the questions? You're going to buzz yourselves in by taking yourselves off mute, calling out your grade. If you say the incorrect answer, the question will go to the next available person, the next person to buzz in. And yeah, that's how it's going to work for trivia. So we're going to get started. Question number one. In what year did Queensland's eight-year State of Origin Series winning streak begin? Yeah. Oh, Wolves. Buzzing in the Wolves. Royal yep, laughter. Right. Wolves, what's your answer? I'm going to go 2007. Ooh, incorrect. Royals, Braves. Royals. Braves, 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 Braves. Not I'm going to give that to the Royals. I heard Royals first. 06? 2006? 2006 is the correct answer. Great Ooh. job, Brian and the How Royals. Good smash. All right, question number two. Which sport requires athletes to compete in alternating rounds of a mental and physical fight where you can win by knockout or by checkmate? Braves. Yes. Yes. Oh, Royals. Yes, Braves. Ah, uh, chess. Royals, Ooh. Royals, Royals. Royals? Royals. Chess boxing. Correct. That's Does another 10 points to the Royals. All right, the next question, question number three, is a who am I? So buzz in when you think you know who it is, and I'll stop talking. So the first is, who am I? I played 116 ODIs for Australia from 2001 to 2009. I'm a left arm fast medium bowler and my best figures were five for 47 yeah. against Mavs, Sri Lanka. Mavs, Mavs. I think I heard, I'm gonna go stags there. <laughs> Yay, um, I'm gonna guess Sachin Tanduka. Incorrect, incorrect. Uh, anyone else, anyone else going out there? Uh, wolves after, Wolves after, Wait a second, wait a second. Yeah. I'm going to give it to Mavs. Nathan Bracken. Nathan Bracken is correct. Good job, Sam and the Mavs. All right, question number four. What does BMX stand for? Wolves. Yes, Wolves? Bicycle motocross. Correct. All right, station. Oh, station. No. Question number five, we have... Iceland lost to France 5-2 in which knockout stage of the UEFA Euro 2016? Wolves. Wolves. In 2016, France beat Iceland in the semi-final. Ooh, Royals. Incorrect. Royals. 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 Quarter-final. That is correct. Another 10 points goes to the Royals. All right. Question number six. How many dimples does the average golf ball have? Lines. Wolves after. Yes, lines. Uh, is it 336? 
correct. All right, question number seven. In 2008, Novak Djokovic won his first ever Grand Slam tournament. Which tournament Mavs. was Wolves, Wolves. Mavs. Mavs there? Australian Open. It was the Australian Open. Great job. All right, question number eight. Which two positions in netball can shoot goals? Goals. 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 Goal shooting, no. goal attack. I said, oh, excuse me, excuse Whoa. me, Whoa. Whoa. excuse me. Whoa. Whoa. Game out. Whoa. Hang on. Yeah, I'm next one. What has <laughs> happened there? What's happened, Chris? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> I'm going to have to say Warriors answered first. So, Warriors, please tell me your answer. Uh, that would be goal shooter and goal attack. Correct. All right, station number nine. Who is the NRL's second most capped player with Wolves. 372 Wolves. appearances? Yep, Wolves. Cooper Cronk. That is correct. 10 points to the Wolves. All right, final question. With the Royals in the lead, when was the last time Australia won an Ashes series? Royals. Royals. Yes, Royals. Um, it would have been the 2019 one. No, that's wrong. Incorrect. Braves was next. Braves is next. Uh, the it would have been 2017. Correct. 2018. Correct. One another point for the Braves. So that is all for the sports round. We have the Royals in the lead on 30 points, closely followed by the Wolves and the Mavs, both on 20 points. So come back next week to see who is going to take out the title. Uh, hey guys, uh, we're going to jump into some prayer, so please pray with me. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that even in this difficult time, um, we can still come together as a youth group online to learn about you, to dive into your word and to praise you, Lord. God, you are all knowing, all loving and all powerful. So I pray that we can continue to trust in your plan for us. Lord, we pray for Pat tonight. We pray that you speak through him, Lord. And I pray that you open our hearts and open our minds to what you have to share with us. Uh, Lord, we praise you for the teams behind the scenes, for the tech teams, for the musicians, for the leaders, and especially for Pat and Emma. Lord, none of this would have happened if you hadn't put them in place. Uh, so, Lord, we just want to thank you again for your plan. Um, and finally, Lord, we pray for tonight. We pray that um, it goes well and that you have your hand on our hearts, God. Um, we just want to thank you for keeping us in your kingdom, God. And we pray that we can continue to grow in our relationship with you. Amen. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed him by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where this man was and when he saw him he took pity on him he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper look after him he said and when i return i will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Well, hello again, Crossfire. It's Pat here. If I haven't met you before, welcome. We're so glad to have you. 
Uh, welcome back, term four. Uh, it's amazing, we're still online, but we are looking forward this term to being back face to face with you guys soon. So get ready for that sometime in November. We can not wait. Uh, we are kicking off a new series for this term as we unpack the Bible week in, week out. We're gonna have D teams on it, so make sure you're in a D team. If you're not, hit up your leaders, get in connection with us through our socials. We would love to get you with a group of people on Zoom at the moment, but soon to be face to face, just chatting over the Bible and life. So make that happen. But we are talking about parables. If you don't know what a parable is, it's a story that is told in order to teach something. And Jesus loved a good parable. It's kind of like when you were in class and you would ask your teacher a question and they would just tell you a story and then walk away and you sit there going, well, wait, did they actually answer my question? I'm not sure, I have no idea. Uh, so we are talking about parables and I'm opening up the series today on a very famous one, which is called The Good Samaritan, a story that Jesus told called The Good Samaritan. Can I pray before we jump into that? Lord, thank you so much for everyone that's joined us here online. And over the next 10 or so minutes, God, would you help us to focus in on who you are? God, would you open your word? Would you make it uh, by your spirit speak to us and change us and move us? Would we hear your voice and understand more of you, God? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this is one of my favorite stories that Jesus ever told. But before we get there, have you ever had that experience where there's kind of like a group of people sitting around chatting about something and you walk up and they fire a completely random question at you? Like, would you rather be punched in the face or kicked in the shin? And you know that whatever you answer is going to make half the group happy and half the group sad. And then you, your response is going to go, well, why? Why are you asking me this? Why are we talking about this? Why are we on this topic? Who am I going to offend? Who am I going to help? What side am I going to be on? One of the things with this famous story of the Good Samaritan is we don't often talk about why we are talking about it. You heard it before in the Bible reading. It's a story of a man uh, being violently attacked on what was kind of a famously violent road and different people walking past and different people helping. But before we get into that story, which I'm just going to look over really quickly and make three really simple observations about, before we get there, I want to ask, why was Jesus telling this story? So that's the first thing we need to think about. Why was Jesus telling this story? And if you've got your Bibles, let's keep it open. So from verse 20, we're in a book of the Bible called Luke, which was an account of Jesus' life. We're in chapter 10, verse 25, and it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So we've got to set the scene. Jesus is teaching, people are listening to him, and one of the experts in the law, that's the people who are experts in the Old Testament, which is most of the Bible, wanted to test Jesus, wanted to see if he could catch him out, wanted to see what Jesus understood and didn't understand. And so he says a question that I think a lot of us ask, Jesus, what must I do in order to inherit eternal life? And that's the question that religions are really built on, aren't they? The idea of what, how do I get to heaven? How do I get from where I am now to kind of happiness and to joy and to eternity? How do I escape this world into a better place? And you see that carried through every sort of ideal in humanity. Either if the people aren't religious, they'll say, oh, they're in a better place. They're at rest now. They're at peace now. Or for all the different religions, there's this different way of experience a positive afterlife. For the Jews, it was the same heaven, heavenly place being with God that we talk about or eternal life. And so this expert in the law says, Jesus, what must I do to get to heaven, to get to that place, to receive eternal life? And so Jesus starts to answer, and he does what I said before. He answers the question with a question. What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus responds to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So basically, this expert in the law, this doesn't happen often in the Bible, gets asked a question by Jesus and 10 out of 10 on the answer. Jesus, what do we have to do in order to inherit eternal life? And this man gives his idea, which is love God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, that is perfect. This is the situation we're in 
where Jesus tells this famous parable, where he tells this famous story, where we're introduced to this story of the Good Samaritan. But before we jump there, I want to see two things in that. The first is that he got it right. And so that means that love is not new. There's this idea that goes around that in the Old Testament, before Jesus, everything that God did was kind of this violent, like retributive justice. I'm going to punish you and it's going to be painful and there's anger and there's all this bitterness. And then Jesus and beyond, God suddenly becomes loving. But that's not true at all. As the expert in the law summed up the Old Testament, summed up what it meant for them to follow God and to live the life that leads us to an eternity with God, it was love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. This idea of love being the key, the, the key function of Christianity, the center of the belief in our God has been there since the beginning of time. And that makes sense. Because in a book like 1 John, it says something as simple as God is love. Love isn't a new concept or isn't something that started with Jesus. God is and always has been love. And he teaches love and he demonstrates love. The fact that Jesus is on earth talking to us before he goes to the cross to die in our place is God's act of love. The fact that he calls believers in him to not only love him, but for that love to cause a reaction in him, in them, to then go, turn into love for other people, that is because God is love. This isn't new. This is from the foundation of the earth and even before then, for as long as God has been, God has been love. The second thing is, this is for you. If you were to stand before Jesus now, you, close your eyes and picture that. You're standing before Jesus and you say, Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? His response to you could very well be, Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Why is that enough? Because as we love God, as we enter into that relationship with God, then we are caught up in everything that Jesus has done for us. His death, His resurrection, paying the price for our sin, and offering us that brand new life. Loving God is enough, not because of the strength of our love, but because everything that God has done for you out of his love. That's the situation we're in. And we dive into this uh, really kind of intense story called The Good Samaritan. Uh, we won't read every word of it. I'm, we had it read out before, and I'm sure a lot of you know it. But a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was beaten on the way by robbers. So he's stripped, and he's beaten, and he's dying on the side of the road. And then we see a Levite walk past. A Levite was someone set aside by God in order to do the work of God in the temple and in the worship services and things like that. And then we see a priest walk by. And the priest, again, set aside by God to lead their people in worship of God. Neither of these people do anything. And then we see a Samaritan. And we have to understand that the audience that Jesus is speaking to hated Samaritans. They were considered dirty, they were considered gross, they were considered to have twisted God's word and ignored the real God and been shameful towards the real God. And then what this Samaritan does is amazing. You see it in verse 34. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn and took care, for him, took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after, the, look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. The conclusion there, Jesus says to the expert in the law, so Jesus has just told this story, who do you think loved his neighbor? We started at the point, well, how do I get to eternal life, God? How do I live forever? Love God and love your neighbor. The expert in the law then says, well, who's my neighbor? And this is Jesus' response. So Jesus asks, who was the one who loved his neighbor? The Samaritan. The man answers, go and do likewise, Jesus says. So it's wrapped up in this neat little bow. How do we receive eternal life? Love God. Love others as yourself. Who are those others? Well, everyone and anyone and those in need and those that you go past. And as I said, I'm going to make some quick observations of that. So I want you to stick with me as we fly through these and then wrap it up. The first observation is that this Samaritan had no motivation. There was nothing for him to say that he had to do it. 
There was nothing to gain for him. There was nothing pushing him. There was nothing connecting him to this person. Sometimes we'll do loving things, we'll do kind things, we'll do generous things, but it's normally to people that we love or people that we care about. I hope that I'm kind and generous and loving and sacrifice of myself for the, the good of my wife and my children and my friends and those I care about. But there was nothing motivating this good Samaritan. He didn't know this man. He didn't have a connection with this man. If anything, kind of the opposite. He had kind of a social disconnect from this man. So he didn't have that kind of drive from a relationship motivating him. He had no motivation. Second, he had nothing to gain. So often when we love people and we help people and we care for people and we're generous to people and we make sacrifices for people, it's because we know there's something in return. That could be as simple as um, reputation. Oh, look at the way that Pat took care of that person. Look how generous he is. No one else is on this road. No one knows what's happening. It could be the fact that, oh, maybe this guy's rich and he'll give me a reward, but there's no talk about that at all. There's nothing in this man's possessions. He's literally stripped naked and left on the side of the road without anything. There is nothing motivating this, this Samaritan in regards to relationship. There is no, nothing to be gained in regards to how he's seen or what he could own or what he could take from the, Samarit from the beaten up person at a later point. And finally, this is the amazing part. With all that in mind, there is no expense spared. They use old language here in the Bible, or the, it's not old language, it's the language of the time to talk about money, denarii. Uh, a denarii was basically a day's wage. So if you were to work two full days, you'd probably earn, let's guess, around $400. That's how much he gave the innkeeper. But it wasn't just money. And it wasn't just that money. He said, I'll be back and I will pay whatever other expenses there are. But you rewind before the money even comes into it, he gets off his donkey and he cares and he uses his own bandages for him. He's got somewhere to go, he's got somewhere to be, so he's inconvenienced, he's happy to be inconvenienced. And then he pours oil and wine to help clean the wounds, which is expensive. And I'm sure a man traveling from city to city had a reason to travel with those things. So he gives up the stuff that he owns, he gives up his money, but he also gives up his time. He goes to the inn and he says, I'll be back. He actually stays the night if you read it carefully. In the morning, he goes to the innkeeper and says, take care of this man, I'll be back. So he stays the night taking care of him before he then goes out. He sacrifices time and he sacrifices convenience. He should be sitting on the donkey. It's his place to ride that donkey all the way into town. But instead, he picks up the beaten person and puts him on the donkey and walks alongside him. And to me, that is a beautiful, beautiful picture of what loving your neighbor looks like. It's not so you can get something back. It's not just because you're motivated by your relationship by them. It's not when it's convenient. And it's not, it's not when it's something you can afford or something that is easy or something that is cheap for you to do. The sort of love that God is calling us to have here is a sacrificial love where we give things up and we pour them out and it's not easy, it's not convenient, it's not cheap, it's, it's not fun, we don't get a reputation out of it, we just do it because we love that person how we feel about ourselves, we care for that person how we care for ourselves, we provide for that person how we provide for ourselves. And again, this is something that modern psychology is just starting to pick up. We're all coming out of this really mentally challenging time. And all the psychologists are saying, well, we need to start caring for other people again. And when we actually take our minds off our needs and our wants and our desires and put them on helping other people, that we will actually be healthier and stronger from that. But you might even think, well, how could I possibly be this sacrificial and this loving? How could I give up so much? How could I be so inconvenienced? How could I give up my things as well and my time? Well, again, let's go back to the context. Why is Jesus telling this story? Well, he's been asked, how do I inherit eternal life? And the answer, love God and love others as yourself. Why? Because God is an example of everything that we have just talked about. Jesus being on earth and telling this story is an example of God's sacrificial love where he gave everything for us. He came and took your sin upon himself dying on the cross, rising again, defeating your sin and defeating your guilt so that you could have this eternal life, so that you could live forever. We have an amazing example of this sort of love in Jesus. And that's before he calls us to go 
and do likewise. So to quickly sum that up, what must we do to live forever with God? We must love Him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind and all our strength and love others as ourselves. How do we do that? Well, we see that Jesus has done it for us and invited us to an eternity with Him. Can't wait to catch you next week, Crosswire. We're just going to head into a time of worship together, so please worship with us. Yeah.